This is what 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be toward some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. You are looking only on the surface of things. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as he. For even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up rather than pulling you down, I will not be ashamed of it. I do not want you to seem to, I, I do not want to seem to be trying to fright you with my letters. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful. But in person, he is unimpressive, and his speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits but will confine our boasting to the field God has assigned to us, a field that reaches even to you. We are not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you, for we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither, neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our area of activity among you will greatly expand so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. For we do not want to boast about work already done in another man's territory, but let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we pray for insight. We pray that your word would touch us deeply that we would hear your voice, and that we would wed the hearing of your voice to the actions that we will take. We pray, God, that you would have this time and speak through me now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. By show of hands, how many of you have taken some sort of self-defense, some sort of martial art or boxing, something like that? Any of you? Good number of you. That's pretty cool. When I was young, I took uh, something called judo. Judo is a martial arts. It's a form of self-defense, and it has to do with wrestling, grappling, and throwing techniques. And in judo, you uh, advance, and as you advance, you get different color belts. So you begin with a white belt, which is a novice, and you work your way up, a yellow belt, then an orange belt, then it goes from orange to green to blue to purple to brown to black. And then if you reach the highest levels of the black belt, you actually get a red belt. It's a pretty cool system they got there. Um, I was in judo when I was very young, and uh, I attained to the high ranking of yellow belt. <laughs> which means that uh, my best defense is that I'm not the slowest person in any group I'm in. That's the thing that I want to make sure. I don't know about you, but, um, you know, we live in a world where there's a very real possibility that we could get physically attacked, in which case that a martial arts could help you. But the likelihood of that is very small. What's really more likely is that you and I will come under spiritual attack. And in that case, martial arts are going to help you. There's something that we need, we need to be prepared for, because all of us will undergo some sort of spiritual attack. 
And we need to be wise about this and understand what we should do and how we should respond and what God is giving us at our disposal. One of the reasons why the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Corinthians was that he needed to defend himself against spiritual attack. There are those who were in the Corinthian church. They had infiltrated the Corinthian church and they were called false apostles. These were people who were prominent and leading others astray. And one of their methods to lead others astray was, first of all, to attack the messenger, the primary messenger of the gospel, and that was the Apostle Paul. Their methodology, their reasoning is this. You discredit the messenger, you can destroy the message. And so in previous weeks, I, as we've gone through 2 Corinthians, I've mentioned the fact that Paul had come under criticism one of the areas that they criticized Paul in is because he had changed his plans, the plans he had established to come visit the church at Corinth. Originally, he said that he was going to go there after he had visited Macedonia. He was writing in Ephesus, and he was going to go to Macedonia. Then he said he would come to Corinth. But he heard some bad things were happening in Corinth. And so what he did was he changed his plans, and he said that he would go straight to Corinth. He would then go to Macedonia. And actually, he would come back to Corinth. So he, would make, he was planning on making two trips to Corinth. When he went there, things did not turn out well. So he changed his plans again. Instead of going from Corinth to Macedonia and back to Corinth, he went back to Ephesus. And he wrote his letter, 2 Corinthians. And so because of all these change in plans, the people who were opposing Paul, those false apostles, they were cr criticizing him. They were saying, look at him. He says yes and no. He makes his plans in a sort of flimsy way. You can't trust this guy. He's not credible. He's not reliable. And so Paul was coming in an attack for something, some things like that. It was interesting how Paul, he also uh, was being criticized because they saw him as being timid. They saw him as being sort of weak. Like when they saw him, when he was interacting with him, he didn't come off as being very forceful at all. In fact, there was a disparity, they said, between what he wrote, how he wrote, and then what he was like in person. And so Paul was coming under criticism for that as well. He's one way in his letters, but boy, he's so unimpressive when you meet him. In fact, when he speaks, he's not very compelling. And so they were using these superficial standards in which to judge whether or not he was truly sent from God. It reminds us that when we think about the things that demonstrate whether or not a person is really a representative of the Lord or not, we have to look at the things of substance, not the things of the world. See, the world would judge us based on how we look. The Lord looks at not the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The, the, the world will judge us based on how eloquent we are. The Lord looks at the substance of the message that we are bringing. The world looks at your worldly status, how wealthy you are, and they, they, must, they, they judge you based on whether or not you have financial means behind you. The Lord understands that there's a richness that comes from being rightly related to him. We cannot use the world's standards. See, some of us, we might be tempted to follow somebody who's impressive. How many of you have thought about, you know, wow, if there is a, uh, a leader who has a large following, he must be good. Those are worldly standards. You have to look at substance, not just the outward 
appearances. And so what I wanted to do is really focus in on verses 3 through 5, these three verses, and this is what it says in these three verses. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. These three verses tell us a lot about spiritual warfare. Let me point out just a couple things that we need to know if we're going to live victoriously. One is spiritual strongholds require spiritual weapons. And two, strongholds are places in our mind that we've given territory over to the enemy. Okay. So the Apostle Paul could see this battle raging in the church of Corinth. It was a battle for the hearts and minds of the believers. They were being fed lies about him. They were being manipulated to look at worldly criteria as the test of true apostleship instead of biblical criteria. And so Paul needs to bring them divine wisdom that sort of cuts through all of the smoke and mirrors that the false apostles were using. And so he says spiritual strongholds require spiritual weapons. What are our spiritual weapons? Let me tell you four spiritual weapons that the Lord has put at our disposal in this spiritual battle. The first is God's word. God's word tells us what the truth is, and the truth sets us free. Ephesians 6 says that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. The Holy Spirit activates the word of God, and when we wield it, it's very, very powerful in spiritual battles. The word of God cannot be substituted for anything else. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, it says, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Think about that for a moment. It is able to separate out soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It, he's using an analogy there. These things that are so closely tied together, the word of God could separate. And the point is, is that he could, the word of God can judge thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It could penetrate deeply into our lives. When we are in the word of God, the word of God could show us our innermost thoughts, our heart attitudes, and so we need to be in the word of God. God uses his word to convict you and to keep you humble. God uses his word to warn you so you don't stray away from him. God will use his word to comfort you when you're in your times of despair and you feel all hope is lost. God will impart wisdom to you so that you don't need to learn every lesson the hard way. We need the word of God in our lives. So many Christians are losing the spiritual battle because they don't know the word of God. They are not in the word of God on a regular basis. I was talking to my daughter uh, a couple weeks ago, and she said, we're talking about uh, pastors and messages. And she says, you know, oftentimes when she goes to... Uh, hear pastors speak or she listens to them, she says they tell you what to do, but they don't tell you how to do it. And I took note of that. So I'm going to tell you how to do something. All right? This is how you get into God's word. This has worked for me, and it may hopefully work for you. You start with scripture, get into the word, you write down one or two verses. Okay? Scripture. Then you observe what's going on in that passage. What is happening? What does it mean? You write that down. And then you look at application. What do you think God wants you to learn or do from this passage? Okay. Then you pray according to what God has just shown you. And then you say, yes, Lord, today I will. And you bring feet to that passage. 
it was in 2001, I went to a conference where um, I learned from a very wise uh, pastor the importance of our devotional life. And we were there to learn about church leadership, and he spent so much time just talking about devotions. And when we first started, the thoughts that ran through my mind was, I came all this way to listen to this pastor teach on church leadership, and he's telling me I need to do devotions. And I thought it was a waste of time. And yet the genius of it all was this. He said, everything will flow out of this. Your ministry will flow out of your time with God. And so if it's what's true of leading churches and being a pastor, it's also true in just our everyday life because you and I, we need to be in God's word daily because daily we face a spiritual battle. And if we are not wielding the weapon that God has given us, they will call us defeated. That's who we will be. We will be a defeated people if we don't know how to use the word of God when we face spiritual battles. Now, you may say, well, I have a different way of getting into God's word. And I would say, that's great. As long as you are connecting with God and applying whatever he is showing you into your life, I'm all for it. This is what I have found, and I've been using it for many years now. And it just helped me to stay close to the Lord, to hear him, and to obey. And then what inevitably happens is this. When I read the word, and I'm meditating it, reflecting on it, what happens is I'm able then to bring that to bear in a situation, usually that day if not that week. It'll come up in a conversation. See, that's the word of God. It's living and active, it says. And so for us, as people of God, we have no excuse. In fact, in the back there, if you don't have a Bible, we are going to give you a Bible. Now, I know most of you are Asians. You'll take anything that's free. Okay, it's for people that don't have Bibles, all right? If you don't have a Bible... Don't leave without one. We have one for you. It's so important for you to be in the Word of God. And as you do this, remember that you're not just reading words on a page. You are reading the very Word of God. That means He is speaking to you. The God of the universe is speaking to you. And He's meeting you. And so you should have this real sense and you should remind yourself, I am in the presence of God as I'm reading His Word. Okay? And so as you do this, as you write things out, and I really encourage you to write or type, whatever you do, but that helps you to reflect. That actually helps you to get clarity on your thoughts. See, so many of us actually read the word, but we don't reflect on it. We don't reflect on it enough. We just read it as it's a thing to do, but unless you actually write it out or type it, you're missing out on actually gaining all that God would have for you as you read the word. You say, well, you know, I don't have enough time to do that. Let me ask you this. How much time do you have to live in defeat? How much time are you wasting living in a way where you are beat down, that you are always struggling, that you're always filled with anxiety and worry, and large because you don't have the word of God in you. See, we don't think we have enough time. I would say you don't have enough time for all those other things. If you're in the word of God, it could save you so much hassle and worry and stress in your life. You'll gain more wisdom. You'll probably become more efficient at things. Some of us love worship music. I know that's how you connect with God. And I just want to tell you, don't substitute worship music for the word of God. Worship music is wonderful. It helps us connect to the Lord. That's a supplement to the word of God, not a substitute. 
Some of you love to connect with God through nature or serving. These are all legitimate ways where you could connect with God. Those are supplements to the Word of God. Okay? The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you directly. See, some of us even think, well, no, I don't read the Word. I listen to messages. I like to go, you know, listen, this is my favorite guy, and I listen to his podcast all the time. He's wonderful. He has great insights. His insights are better than I could ever glean. And so you substitute being in the Word of God, and you say, I'm going to listen to this guy, and he's going to tell me what the Word of God says. And there's value in that. I'm not saying don't do that. That's a supplement, not a substitute. Because God wants to speak to you directly through his Word. And he wants to train you and teach you how you could glean and hear his voice as you read the word. Second thing that, second weapon God has given us is our authority. God has given us authority that comes from our faith, our relationship with Christ. Matthew 28 tells us that God has given us a commission. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that we are his ambassadors. Matthew 10 says that Jesus' disciples were given authority to drive out demons, to heal every disease and sickness, and to preach the gospel. We have authority. John 17 says that just as the Father sent Jesus, Jesus sends us. We have authority. Okay. You get to do cool stuff. You have the authority to do and to act on behalf of the Lord. During Freedom in Christ, several people made mention of the fact of how blessed they were because there were a multitude of teachers that taught, people who shared their testimonies, people who were intercessors who were praying, people who were preparing food, people who were cleaning, and they looked at this small army of people, and people were doing various things, and it was such a blessing. It was such a blessing because people were acting and ministering out of the authority that Christ had given them. You have authority. When it comes to spiritual warfare, you could exercise your authority to rebuke the enemy's strongholds in your life. In Jesus' name, leave. That's a very powerful statement. It's a very powerful word. You know, God created everything by the word of his mouth. He spoke everything into existence. And we understand the power of the, the word. And when you use the word in spiritual warfare, it's very powerful. And you have the authority to do that. See, sometimes you think, well, I got to call the pastor. I got to call the elder. And that's fine. You should, you know, we're there to serve and help. But we don't want you to think that you don't have authority. As believers in Christ, there's this thing that we call, it's in theology, it's called the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers. It's one of those things that came out of the Reformation because in the, during, before that time, for a number of centuries, the Catholic Church had given uh, the, the doctrine, the teaching that there are certain people, the priests, who could do certain things but not the lay people. And one of the beautiful things that came out of the Reformation was a getting back to the Bible and understanding that the Bible gives us the authority and that we are all priests. We could all have ministry. We could all be used by the Lord. We've been given authority. And it's not humble to say, oh, no, 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 that's not me. That's not humility. That's disobedience. And those who don't walk in their authority are victims. They will continue to be a victim of the spiritual battle that they're facing because they're not exercising the authority that God has given them. Third, third weapon is the gospel. Ephesians 6, 15 says, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. This is the context of uh, Ephesians 6 is 
the spiritual armor of God. And part of the spiritual armor of God is the gospel. And I love the fact that it says that the gospel is on our feet. It, it, you know, it, it says the breastplate of, of righteousness, the belt of truth, things like that, helmet of salvation. But it says it's on our feet. And it tells me, oh, the gospel, we're meant to go. We're meant to bring the gospel. And the gospel tears down the strongholds of spiritual blindness. The gospel is key to bringing life and light into dark situations. The gospel is a powerful weapon. And we need to be ready always ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us. We always have to be ready, it says. Fourth weapon that the Lord has given us is praying in the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 18 says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. To pray in the Spirit could mean you pray in a tongue. Some of us have the gift of tongues. So praying in the spirit could encompass praying in a tongue, especially when you sense that there's spiritual warfare taking place. But I would submit to you that praying in a tongue is one aspect of praying in the spirit. Because if you look at this verse, it also says, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints, right? But it also says before that, on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests, okay? So if we're going to have all different kinds of prayers and requests, see, when people pray in a tongue, they don't know what they're praying, right? But this is encouraging us to pray with all different kinds of, of, of prayers and requests. It seems to engage our minds so we know, you know, what we're praying for. But there's a way, I believe, of praying in the Spirit that is not necessarily counter to tongues, but it's in addition to tongues, and that would be that we are being led by the Spirit of God, that we are listening to the Holy Spirit, that we're not just speaking, we're listening, and then praying as we feel and sense the Spirit leading us. Pray in the Spirit. Be connected to the Spirit. Listen to the Spirit. Earlier, I, I said that strongholds are places in our mind that we've given territory over to the enemy. When some people say that something's just in your mind, they mean that it's not real. They mean that, oh, it's not actual, it's just in your mind. I'm not using that word in that way. There is a real battle and it's in our minds. It's in the way we think. Okay? The rap battle that rages in our minds is real. Have you ever thought some of these thoughts? You know, I work hard all day. And then my wife tells me I need to come home and do chores. What has she been doing all day? You ever think those thoughts? How about this? You know, Mom and Dad, they're always on my back. Man, I wish they would stop nagging me. Or it's so clear that my brother or my sister, they're the favorites of the family. How about this? I'm never going to amount to much. I'm totally worthless. Or how about this? ping pong game. Do you ever play this game in your mind? Say you're sorry. Don't say you're sorry. Say you're sorry. Don't say you're sorry. <laughs> say you're sorry. No, no, no. Or how about this? Jimmy forgot his coat. Jimmy's going to catch a cold. The cold is going to turn to pneumonia. Jimmy's going to die. I'm such a bad parent. How could I kill my own son? How about this one? God doesn't care. God doesn't care about me. If God cared about me, then such and such would not have happened. He doesn't care. 
These are the types of thoughts that keep, that keep people bound in bitterness, bound in unforgiveness, bound in pride, bound in anxiety, bound in depression, bound in unfruitfulness. And our society gives us messages, too, that Christians embrace without thinking about it. See, we, we live in a society, and we, we feel what's going on, and it's so uncomfortable for us because the values of the society don't match what we believe our Christian values are, and so we start to morph our values, right? Everything, the society says, everything is okay. Any type of sex is okay. As long as it's consensual, it's okay. Society would tell us, there's not even a gender anymore. There's, there's no male, there's no, it, it, it's just fluid. And we take the most absurd ideas and we say, oh, okay. If people feel that way, that must be okay. And we have no mooring, no anchor. We start to adopt the values of the society. And it's in our minds. The battle is for our minds because if, we, if, if the enemy can control the way we think, he can control the affections of our heart. Second Corinthians 10.5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Take captive every thought. That means that you bring your thoughts back in alignment with the word of God. You bring your thoughts back into what you know to be the truth from the word of God. When we do that, our, li our lives begin to come into alignment with God's heart and God's will. Not our own will, not society's will, but the Lord's will. And so all of us face this battle. None of us are exempt. The question is whether or not we're going to take the weapons that God has given us, if we are going to wield those weapons in a way where we're going to win the battles, the battles for our minds that leads to the affections of our hearts. I want to ask the uh, worship team to come on up. And as you consider today's message, maybe today there's just a conviction you have because you've been neglecting God's word and you've been pretty creative in how you've neglected God's word maybe you've just substituted for other things maybe you convince yourself that if God really wanted you, you to read his word he would have made it a whole lot easier to understand you ever thought that one that is so hard to understand God understands that if I don't read it because he made it so difficult Maybe you've tried to convince yourself of that one. I think the, the beauty of God's word is that, as some have said, it's shallow enough for the most simple of us to swim in it. And yet it's deep enough for the, for the scholars even, the scholars not to test the depth of it. I love the word of God. And you and I, if we're going to grow and win the battles, we're going to have to be in the word. If you have a heart's desire to be more regular in the word of God, here's a suggestion. Partner with somebody. Somebody, maybe it's in your community group. Maybe it's uh, your spouse. Maybe it's just a good friend. Just contact them and ask them and say, hey, would you like to get together and get into God's word together? And just spend a little bit of time together reading, 
writing down what you've, your insights, sharing them, praying for one another. You know, I don't think we have enough lifetime to neglect that. We spent enough of our life living in defeat, living in worry, living in depression, living in unfruitfulness. I think it's time there's a shift. And I think that's going to be the most important shift we can make for some of us. Let's get back into the word of God. Would you pray with me?